How's everyone doing today? Are you awake? Getting in the middle of the afternoon? All right. So yes, um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I am interested in studying in particular the, the impact of UV on characterizing exoplanets. And a lot of my research comes down to this question of are we alone in the universe? I'm really interested in can we detect life in the universe? And keep in mind, I'm not talking in this talk about intelligent life. I'm only talking about things like microbes, single-celled organisms that hopefully we will be able to detect by looking for molecular fingerprints of biosignatures in the atmosphere of these planets. And we've already heard a lot of this from David Catling's talks earlier and, and other ones today. So this comes to the question of what's a biosignature? And the strongest biosignature, one of the strongest, is the combination of an oxidizing and a reducing gas together. On Earth, that's something like oxygen and ozone in combination with methane. And this is because you could get abiotic oxygen through the photolysis of water or CO2 and the loss of hydrogen, as we already heard today, or methane from volcanoes. And so again, it comes back to this uh, combination of gases that's important and understanding if we're actually seeing a true biosignature or not. So one thing that I want you to take away is that biosignatures really require context. They require things like knowing the surface temperature, the, whether it's a rocky planet, whether it has CO2 and water. And CO2 and water by themselves are not biosignatures, but they are useful for uh, us to understand whether the planet has conditions that are conducive to life and uh, have greenhouse gas and habitability and are useful for food for microbes. Other biosignatures are things like nitrous oxide, methyl chloride, and dimethyl sulfide. Or, uh, and, and these are uniquely maybe biosignatures because they don't have any known abiotic sources. So sometimes we would think of these as maybe being, if we see those in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, they might indicate life by themselves. But we want to try to find these biosignatures around other stars. And, and I love this pale blue dot image, as we all know and, and love in astronomy, because if an alien astronomer were looking at Earth, they would be able to see these signs of life in our atmosphere by looking for things like methane in combination with oxygen and ozone. And we have a vegetation red edge. And so hopefully we'll get the first hint of these by being able to characterize Earth-like extrasolar planets with uh, things like the James Webb Space Telescope and large ground-based observatories in the next decade. And so for my research, I'm really interested in this question of how does the star impact the atmosphere, spectral signatures, at features and biosignatures that we might see. So I, I'm going to talk a lot about various types of stars, hot stars and cool stars, and not these kinds of hot stars and cool stars, but more the FGKM ones that we're all familiar with. And when we go from F to M stars, we're really thinking of high UV to low UV environments, broadly speaking. And UV is really important in our understanding of biosignatures because UV can destroy some biosignatures, such as methane, making them maybe less abundant in the atmosphere around uh, an environment with high amounts of UV. But it also produces, of course, other biosignatures such as ozone, which is the photolytic product of oxygen. And so uh, UV also, it's not just the amount of UV, but the balance between the far UV and near UV that matters. And this is in part due to, we can see this in the Chapman reactions, which produce ozone, because you have certain reactions which need really the far UV and other ones which can go forward with just near UV. And so it's not just enough to know like what's the bulk UV coming in, but also the balance between the full characterization of that UV radiation field. And so I, I do modeling of atmospheres, and to do that I'm going to talk a little bit about how I go about this. We take an input stellar spectrum, and, and then I'm going to put this into a climate code uh, the, and, and calculate which assumes a fixed chemistry and then calculates a temperature pressure profile. And then you can feed that into a photochemical code, which using that temperature pressure profile calculates the reaction rates and, and updates the abundances of those species. You iterate back and forth between these two codes until you get a stable atmosphere solution. The output of this, so that's like the atmosphere part of the code. The output of this then can go into a line by line radiative transfer model, which will get you the remotely detectable spectra that we hope to someday observe for these planets. And so, um, though I've done a lot of work on also FGK stars today, just in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on M stars because they're very exciting. And M stars we know are also 
uh, really timely because uh, one in four M stars are thought to have a habitable planet. And of course, they're the most abundant stars in the universe, as well as they're going to have the small star advantage for our first observations. But as we also have already heard today, uh, M stars have other problems with them. They remain active for very long periods of time and have strong flares. So modeling uh, uh, planets around M stars does come with some problems. When I first studied M stars, I was a little surprised when I saw this figure, because here's the M subspectral types, so ranging from M0 stars to M7 stars, and the active lifetime. And you can see here that even the early M stars are already active for much longer than a G star. Uh, they're active for one to two billion years. But then as you flip into the, the later M stars, they're remaining active for six to eight billion years. That's a really long time. And so we have to think of uh, when we do atmospheric modeling of exoplanets, we need to really know kind of what type of activity we're dealing with. And so here's this little cartoon image where I'm going to just talk about the, some of the broad categories that I deal with in my atmospheric models. So one is an active type star. That's something like 80 Leo, a young, bright, flaring M star, the, the brightest and flaring star that you can get. But then the inactive model would be something like this, and that's just a Phoenix model. So just a photosphere, no chromospheric emission, and we don't actually know of any stars that are that inactive. Because when we see stars that are quiescent, they're typically classified as quiescent, they look something more like this. So they have H alpha uh, in absorption, but they still um, have quite a bit of chromospheric emission. But the one key thing that we really need to figure out here is we don't actually know for what the floor of the UV flux is. We don't know, while we know some of the emission peaks, we haven't yet been able to detect and push to the lowest boundary of what the continuum is between these emission peaks. So that means, is the continuum really, is it here? Is it down all the way to the photosphere? We actually don't know yet. And we, I think it's a vital thing that we need to, to learn about in the next few years, especially while we have Hubble, in order to um, uh, better understand what's happening in the atmospheres of planets orbiting M stars. So I think uh, modeling with real UV is, is very important. And this is the same. Uh, figure as before, only now with real stars. So this is, like I said, AD, U, AD Leo, a quiescent star, and, and the red is just the Phoenix model, and you can see here that there's 10 orders of magnitude if you were to just naively not assume uh, a, a real uh, UV uh, star in your model. So this is why we need to have observations of the UV of the host star. And uh, I wanted to show this also just on a linear scale, because what we're really talking about is just this part of the flux. And it doesn't seem like that UV would be, it's not that big of a fraction of the total flux, but it's really what's driving all the atmospheric chemistry and our understanding of what's ultimately going to be in the atmosphere. And so let's look at some planet uh, uh, direct detection IR spectra. And here you can see, I'm just going to show kind of the extreme cases um, and just for a few of them. So this is an M0 and an M9 uh, for the active stellar models, this is for the minimum possible UV. And then for the muscle stars, these, uh, these six uh, typically classified quiescent stars, and, and looking for an Earth-like planet and just changing it around these different stars. So the first thing that pops out at you is some of these features could change dramatically depending on how much UV you have. And even for the Hubble stars, you start to see this dip in the uh, 18 micron feature for N2O. And so knowing what the UV level is and how low UV could be around these M stars and for cool stars, I think is really going to be important for us to try to see if we can detect biosignatures. Obviously, um, UV also impacts things like methane and, and, of course, ozone, because ozone is produced by UV. So what I want to show you is just kind of a, an example between the two extremes. So this is an Earth-like planet orbiting the same stellar effective temperature but just with the minimum and maximum UV. And so here, here's that case where you have the black line is a young flaring star, and then this would be the lowest possible UV that you might expect. And you can see that the features uh, change quite a bit just based on what's created and destroyed in the atmosphere of those planets. Keep in mind that this uh, red model is probably lower than what we would actually expect for real stars, because real stars probably don't have that low of UV. But uh, this leads into one of the projects that I was talking about on Monday. Uh, we found these planets uh, around uh, the TRAPPIST system, 
And so uh, one of the things that we want to do is when we start thinking about even cooler stars is how are we going to get the UV for that? Because right now we don't have observations of, of uh, characterizing the UV of uh, brown dwarfs. And so maybe scaling down some of these later M stars or scaling up UV from Jupiter Aurora because we've already uh, last year detected Aurora around some brown dwarfs. So the second thing that I wanted to, oh, sorry. I just want to summarize this part of it with the stellar type really matters, the UV really matters, and uh, I hope I've convinced you of that. So the, the thing that I wanted to talk about just briefly before the end of this talk is that planets change. We've also heard this uh, today with uh, David's talk. We have planet evolution from geology, plate tectonics, and life. These things are all intertwined, like Colin, Colin uh, uh, nicely stated at the end of his talk. And, and we've also already seen this figure of the Earth's kind of general atmospheric state over time. So here you have time in billions of years in these concentrations. We maybe had more CO2 at the beginning, uh, the rise of methanogenesis, and then, of course, the rise of oxygen um, uh, here in maybe two different steps. And so um, I'm going to show in the next few slides here four types of atmospheres, something that's a prebiotic atmosphere, a 1% oxygen uh, concentration, 1% uh, of modern, so that would be 0.021, uh, to, you know, to one. and then 10% of modern concentrations, and then modern Earth uh, type atmosphere around different types of stars. And so this is for that, this is that figure. So here on the top is the prebiotic case with these FGKM stars uh, uh, that I told you about before. And then this would be the 1% of modern concentrations, 10%, and finally the modern atmosphere. Uh, what we first, of course, obviously jumps out is the ozone feature. As we would expect, as oxygen rises, we start to see the formation of ozone. And for F stars, this happens very early. Uh, right, right when you don't need that much oxygen to get quite a substantial ozone shield uh, in Earth's history. And in fact, it's even stronger here for these 1% uh, and 10% than it is uh, at uh, modern oxygen concentrations for the F stars. Uh, another thing that we really want to maybe detect, going back to this idea that uh, biosignature is the combination of an oxidizing and a reducing gas, we would love to be able to see something like methane and ozone in combination in the future to see if we're seeing life. Um, as well, the carbon dioxide feature, that central emission peak can be a secondary indicator of a, a thermal inversion in the atmosphere and can also be useful for us to detect. So looking at the oxygen feature in the visible, uh, so this is now just one feature, not the whole spectrum, but for the same four cases, uh, you can see for the clear sky case, you get the little dip here and then a uh, bigger dip and, of course, the nice big oxygen feature. But when we move that to consider 60% clouds, um, you can see, so this is 0%, and then you have 1% one, uh, 1 of modern concentrations, you really, it really diminishes that feature. And I showed a, a different plot when I was explaining uh, some of the projects on Monday. This as well, when you have 10% oxygen, you get uh, a kind of nice feature, and it, clouds really diminish it, but the, the effect isn't so strong for the modern atmosphere. And so um, the situation is different for ozone, though, because ozone's in the IR, and the, the features behave a little differently. And so here you can see uh, this is the clear sky for these four epochs for the different star types and the 60% clouds. And there's not, you know, uh, comparing the two, there's not so great of a difference like you saw in the, in the visible part of the spectrum. So comparing those two together, uh, our detectability of oxygen versus ozone through time, ozone would pop out much quicker. Uh, in Earth's history, if a planet's following Earth's history, than, than oxygen just because of, of the clouds. And, and all solar system planets uh, do have clouds. So that, that tied into one of the projects I was thinking a student might be interested in, is looking at a more wider range of cloud parameters and properties and, and seeing if uh, we can hammer down exactly how the detectability of uh, oxygen is going to be impacted. So in summary, um, UV really dominates the atmosphere and the spectra of extrasolar planets. Uh, to know the planet, we really need to know the star UV. Uh, I think we're learning that more and more in, in a lot of different uh, situations here. Clouds for oxygen is maybe, maybe going to make it much more difficult for us to detect, but for ozone, uh, it's not so much of a problem. Uh, on my website, there's some products and tools you might find interesting. You can, of course, talk to me about them while we're here. I have a high-resolution planet spectral database uh, going from visible to IR for uh, 
20 different stellar, 27 different stellar types and four different geological epochs for all these planets, so a nice big grid of kind of a range of planets that you might want to look at, as well as a high resolution input stellar spectrum with accurate UV modeling and observations from uh, Hubble and the International, the IUE. Uh, please feel free to come and chat with me about any of these things. I love talking about all of them. And uh, with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Uh, so I think that's, uh, so that paper's from West 2008, and that's looking at, in particular, H-alpha and emission, uh, which they have, uh, they averaged up each spectral, subspectral type within the M spectral class, because uh, that's how M stars are typically classified as active or not. So if the H-alpha is an emission, and, yeah. Hmm. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the, the West 2008 paper. I know he's also written stuff on the, the rotation rates as well. I think just recently with uh, Zach Berta on rotation rates and activity and lifetimes of M stars. But with this database, um, I know it was like taking H alpha measurements and looking at the fraction, fraction of these planets uh, or stars that are uh, observed to be active or inactive. And they had about like 2,000 or something that they average. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, well, you know, so we were talking a lot about it today with uh, David Catling, but so basically when we're, when we're thinking about an atmosphere uh, with the climate code, you know, you have the radiation coming in on the top of the atmosphere. Um, you uh, have, like, you know, uh, heating by water and, and carbon dioxide and ozone, and then that really sets, you know, your, your relations for, for the, uh, the climate profile, like these bulk greenhouse gases. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, that, that's where you start. And then you take that to then feed into a photochemical model and use those temperatures and pressures to see what the reaction rates are. That feeds back into the climate. You know, does that change? Do you get, you know, more greenhouse gas? And then you would have additional warming. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting uh, point. And it's been pointed out by Frank Celsus, actually, uh, over a decade ago, in that uh, it kind of washes out its own feature. And so, so what happens is, is um, the hot stratosphere. So if you think, uh, so I didn't show this plot, but um, basically F stars have a much hotter stratosphere because of that additional ozone. So the ozone heats up that stratosphere. And then the temperature difference between the stratosphere and the surface isn't that great. And, and so in the IR, it's also the difference between, you know, the surface, where the surface is emitting as a black body, and then where the, uh, the temperature of the layer that's doing the, uh, that you're seeing the feature from, that temperature difference really matters in addition to the abundance. So in the visible uh, spectrum, it's just the abundance of a, of a gas that, that determines, you know, this feature depth, whereas in the IR, it's the temperature difference. And so as you heat up the stratosphere, it makes that temperature difference decrease and therefore it washes out that feature. And so in fact, for the hottest F stars, you actually start to see the ozone feature go into emission because, uh, because of that. So that's, so that's basically why. So it is interesting as well as um, some other spectral types for modern Earth uh, have stronger ozone features, like the K stars have a stronger ozone feature even though they have less ozone, but because the temperature difference is greater. So, so it's not, you know, it's a little less intuitive and, and that's also why clouds are not quite as intuitive either because it relates back to these, these temperature differences. Some of them, some of them. We don't know the floor. We know some of them. Yeah, so, so I think it does because, um, uh, you know, I haven't done a full sensitivity, sensitivity test where, you know, I've tried different, different amounts, but I did do one where, like, I just 
only increase Lyman and alpha because everyone um, is like, oh, Lyman and alpha is the only thing that matters for M stars, but that's not true. So you can take, you know, Lyman and alpha and multiply it even by like a million times or a billion times, and it actually doesn't change what's happening in the atmosphere. So that's why I would, I would think that the continuum really matters. And so uh, for some stars, uh, we, we have measured the continuum, but other stars, we haven't measured the continuum. And, and I think that's something that is important for us to do going forward. I think I'm done. I think they're kicking me off stage now. <laughs> Thank you.